Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you very much for coming to this last uh, linguistics department seminar. I don't think I have to stop, stop talking now. <laughs> uh, the last linguistics department seminar of 2014. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Johanna um, Hartman, you know, call yourself. <laughs> Ex the Paul Lee Wayne Walford. Um, from the University of Munster. I knew we'd be started somewhere else would come here. Uh, Johanna is a PhD um, candidate um, and also research assistant in variation <coughs> linguistics at the University, University of, uh, of Münster in, in Germany. And it's, I'm, I'm looking at the attitudes that Africans have to different varieties of English, international different varieties of English. Okay. And I'm just uh, comparing them to Germans as a reference group. So. Yeah, to see what's specific <laughs> about their answers. Okay. okay, anyway, welcome and uh, I look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and I'm very happy to see you here. Um, yeah, I hope you don't mind that I deliver this talk sitting down. Unfortunately, I can't stand up for extended periods of time, so I hope that everyone can see me, and then I think um, that should work well. So, yeah, Julia already um, introduced my PhD topic, so I'm looking at attitudes to different varieties of English, by which I mean different varieties of English worldwide in African communities in the UK and Germany. So it's a bit complicated because lots of different groups and uh, different um, speakers with different backgrounds come in. But I mean, that's um, what is also, I think, essential about my PhD research to show that uh, things are sometimes not simple and that you have to actually look at international and transnational things as well. And so that's the first short introduction to something important about my PhD project. And I'll get started here. So a roadmap for today, I'll first give you a short introduction and talk about the aims of my project and the aims of today's presentation, which are, um, which overlap, <laughs> let's just put it like that. And um, then I'll um, have a short look at uh, important tendencies that have been established in previous language attitudes research on varieties of English and then I'll focus briefly on Kenyan and Nigerian communities in Germany and the UK. Then I'll talk about what I actually do in my uh, PhD, so which data am I using, which methods am I using and um, so as you can see from numbers five and six there, um, there are two essential things, um, interviews and an excellent evaluation study, and I'll quickly talk about both parts and then have a short discussion and outlook section there. So you could already see in point three there that I have to kind of focus not on Africa uh, in general as my um, the title of my talk uh, sa says, but I'm sure you're all aware that um, you cannot really say Africa. And um, I discussed with my supervisor that it would be good for now to focus on these two groups for several reasons, um, some of which are practical because I have a lot of people, or most people from these two groups. And um, also um, they might give different perspectives because they're from entirely different areas in Africa. Um, but, um, as I also can already say now, I think they also overlap <laughs> in some things. And, um, uh, yeah, so I think that's all for now. So, a quick word about the spread of global English. There are lots of different approaches to describe the spread of English worldwide. This is just one approach that's a, a map in Schneider. And he just says, okay, these are the territories worldwide where English has some sort of a special status. So, um, yeah, that I think does not include the English as a foreign language countries, but just those where it actually has some sort of official um, status. And we're all aware, I think, that the spread of English worldwide is enormous um, and that it also comes to some extent at the cost of other languages, smaller languages, 
that are thankfully being researched a lot here at SOAS. And, um, but nonetheless, I've decided to look at English, at this killer language, because I think that the spread of English is also not very straightforward, not very simple, and that some varieties of English or some accents of English might be um, just, you know, as they seem to have a far lower status than others, and so there are really problematic tendencies if you look at the different varieties of English as well. Um, then I would just quickly, I'm sure most of you must have seen this model, it's, it's presented in different ways as well, so, but I think um, one of the most important models to describe um, the spread of worldwide English is Kachru's circles model of English and you have three circles, the inner, outer and expanding circle and um, the model has been criticized as well but nonetheless it's used so widely and it's also useful I think to have a first description for the language situations that exist regarding English so for the inner circle um, that includes countries like, for example, Great Britain or the US that would be considered to be English uh, countries where English is spoken as a native language and they are thought to be providing the norm of English for the other countries. Then you have the outer circle countries, which would be countries uh, where English is spoken as a second language or, but nonetheless where it also has a, a very important status and um, where very often new norms of English are developing. So um, I think a lot of African countries would actually fall into this so-called outer circle of English. And then we have the expanding circle of English, which um, yeah, includes mostly countries where English still has an important role, but is where English is spoken as a foreign language and where really um, people are norm dependent, so they look to other countries in the kind of English that they speak and that they learn. And um, I just wanted to quickly introduce this because I'm using these terms as well and you need to know what I'm talking about here. And as I said, it's not an unproblematic model, it's been criticized, but nonetheless, I think it's quite helpful for a first impression. Okay, now I've um, kind of started to talk about the global spread of English and um, one thing that we should all be aware of, I think, is that these varieties of English, these different accents of English don't just exist side by side. And as Maya has put it so nicely, the concert of world Englishes, in his opinion, is not a happy democracy of voices. So um, there are blatant inequalities and power differentials even among the standard varieties, but also among non-standard varieties and between the two, of course, um, in English. And uh, Maya um, puts forward a hierarchy of Englishes in which he says American English is the hub, so the most important variety. And he would say that it's now also um, more important for most people than British English, which I think can be doubted, but um, I mean, he says so. So that's one approach. And um, <laughs> Blomard um, also. Um, points out that there are very much hierarchical systems of value in this concept of world Englishes and that different centers are competing for authority here. And especially in the so-called post-colonial contexts, um, it's been, well, a very common tendency also that um, there has been a movement from a very much exonormative orientation, so an, an orientation towards a variety of English from outside a country to an endonormative orientation, so a, an orientation to um, a variety from inside the country, but that's just one, um, one um, point where we can see different uh, centers or a change of normativity and there are obviously very different tendencies in other contexts as well. Um, Blommer talks very much about something that is or could be called a clash of norms. So um, what's considered to be good English in one place doesn't necessarily have to be considered to be a good English in another place. And 
especially he says it's problematic that the norms of the so-called center differ from the norms of the so-called periphery. And problems arise particularly in translocal contexts, of course, <laughs> um, where people move between different places and where they actually encounter um, very concrete consequences of this clash of norms. And they might discover that the resources that they've been using all along and that they and everyone else may be considered something good is suddenly not valued any longer. And so that's, I think, an important point about my research as well, because I'm obviously looking at people who move between different places. Okay, so the aims of this project. I would like to describe the attitudes towards different varieties of English among Kenyans and Nigerians who live here in Europe, in Germany and the UK. And um, I would also like to, so basically I'm looking at the spread of English from an attitudinal perspective. Um, I mean, I showed you a couple of approaches to this, but most have not been based on attitudes towards these varieties. So I'm looking at which consequences this spread of English has on attitudes that people show. And I'm analyzing the role of the different Englishes and the norms connected to them in the very complex linguistic ecology of the speakers. And as a last point, especially for today's presentation, um, I would like to suggest an expansion of the terminology exo and endonormativity that has been put forward by Amon um, and used a lot for the description of language attitudes because I think it's not sufficient for the context. It doesn't really cover the concepts that I need. So, Okay, previous tendencies in language attitude research to give you some background, especially in the early studies on varieties of English and attitudes towards them. Um, there have been a lot of studies that have shown that RP is evaluated as very high in prestige. But on the other hand, US English and or local varieties from the settings where people did their research were sometimes um, evaluated as high in solidarity. And examples of this are, for example, Giles in the UK or um, Ball for Australia and the others you can see there. There have also been more recently studies that have shown that American English might be equaling or replacing the UK varieties as the prestige accent. Most notably, um, Bayard et al. have shown this in New Zealand and Australia, or Mackenzie for Japan. But on the other hand, then, for example, Garrett et al. in 2005 have also shown that there might be yet negative evaluations of American English. So this goes back also again to Meyer's claim that American English might become or be already be the hub of world Englishes. And um, from an attitudinal perspective, that's still to be debated, I guess. Um, when we look at the accents that are used in the people's own backgrounds in their home countries or um, their um, home territories. Uh, there are also different tendencies. So, um, for example, for New Zealand, Bayard has shown a downgrading of the own accent and has said that there's something that could be called a cultural cringe. So people are not proud of their own accents and they rather choose a different one. But on the other hand, in some contexts, there has also been shown that there's a growing acceptance of local, a local standard English. Uh, shown for Kenya in a study that a non, what they call non-ethnically marked Kenyan English is preferred over native English and an ethnically marked kind of English for the public domain. And then there's also a study by Mutonya for Africans in the US that they show a loyalty towards heavily accented local varieties from Africa. There are exceptions, but outer circle contexts are not exactly the contexts that have been researched mo most widely. In some of the studies that I've shown you now, you could also see that um, the inner circle contexts have been very much researched. 
and um, there have been outer circle contexts as well in some studies, but it's not exactly um, at the heart of attitude research. Also, diaspora and migrant communities, um, there are some studies on African diaspora or migrant communities and a their attitudes towards varieties of English. Um, Mutonia, the one that I just named, would be one of them, and there are others, but um, I think there's still need for more studies. And that is so even though Blomart points out that a sociolinguistics of globalization is perforce a sociolinguistics of mobility. And so I think diaspora and migrant communities should really be at the heart of these studies because um, they can really provide insight into what's actually going on <coughs> um, in this sociolinguistics of globalization and um, so this move from one country to another where speakers of English are actually mobile and where different varieties of English, different accents of English are not just something that they encounter on a holiday or on some basis of whatever sort, but where this is actually a very personal and very concrete experience for everyone, um, I think is, yeah, this is a very important context to look at. Okay, before I move on to my study, I would like to give a sh very short explanation about my not very um, refined use of the words diasporas and immigrants here today. So I know that there are lots of different definitions and um, you can go to um, very fine-grained definitions, but I would like to include two points here for my study and for today. So um, Clifford has pointed out that there's <laughs> one difference between the two, that immigrants are en route to a whole new home in a new place, whereas diasporas are groups that maintain important allegiances and practical connections to a homeland or a dispersed community located elsewhere. Um, Maya Court claims that this distinction cannot and should not be upheld for different reasons and for what I'm doing here, I agree. So I'm not really <coughs> um, distinguishing here. And I think what's important is that the connections to the homeland, as well as transnational networks, as well as the new environment matter for most people I talk to or most people who contributed to my study. So basically, from this, this definition that Clifford's give, both aspects or all aspects come in and um, I don't think in that respect there should be um, should be a distinction between the two. And in this situation where connections to the, the home country, transnational networks and the new environment matter to people, obviously that results in very complex linguistic ecologies for the people. So they encounter not just different Englishes, but also their first languages, of course. Um, but if we just look at the Englishes, so there are indigenized L2 varieties very often. For some, English is also the mother, mother tongue. Some, for some, they are pigeonized and creolized varieties of English. Then they encounter British English, particularly if they're in Great Britain, of course. Um, they might encounter foreign learner Englishes here as well as in Germany. And um, then if they're in Germany, obviously German um, comes in as well. On top of that, very often there's contact between the different varieties or obviously always there's contact between different varieties. Um, so for example, also between the different migrants Englishes. So, as I said, I think in this situation, this is really an experience that I think everyone I talk to encounters on a daily basis and that also matters to a lot of people. Um, some people have actually told me in interviews that that's been the story of their life, this walking between different accents and between different linguistic resources. and. Um, if you just put it like this, you have this wonderful list of different languages or varieties that come together, but I think it's important that it also 
matters to people. Okay, a few numbers about Kenyan and Nigerian communities in Germany and the UK. Um, it's incredibly difficult to actually get numbers that you can rely on. <laughs> I tried to use some sources that um, seem to make sense, so but I will not uh, yeah, put it down to the exact numbers there. What we can see from the numbers though, and I think that's pretty certain, is that the communities in Germany are obviously far smaller than those in the UK, which also makes sense because um, in the uh, UK people speak English and for a lot of Kenyans and Nigerians um, that is a huge plus if they want to uh, go abroad then the language problem or factor doesn't come in as much as in Germany where it's even more difficult to find jobs and to enter a university and so on. Um, we can also see that a lot of them are um, in their very best age, so in their 30s or between tw 20 and 40. Um, that goes, I think, for all the communities there. And um, so they are fairly young still. In England, most Kenyans and Nigerians are apparently based in London. The research questions that I'm asking, so the overarching question is obviously tied to my aims very much. Which attitudes do Kenyans and Nigerians in Germany and the UK hold towards different varieties of, Englishes, uh, of English? But then there are a couple of sub-questions that I'm particularly interested in, also in the light of the previous research that I've just very briefly had a look at with you. So. Um, one important question f is what is the status of British and American English for my respondents? Then is there a growing acceptance or a downgrading of the home country varieties for my respondents? And then, um, because I would like to get a little more complete picture, I would also like to ask how are other outer circle and expanding circle varieties evaluated? And in order to find out a bit more about what um, the, the answers actually mean. I think it's also very interesting to have a look at a reference group because if you just look at one group and their answers then you can't really say okay um, would this be different from another group but I think um, from looking at a reference group that can give you an additional insight into the actual answers of your group. So regarding my method, I'm combining two approaches, a quantitative and a qualitative approach, and I think they're both, both necessary and both helpful. And in the quantitative approach, I have a, an accent evaluation study with vocal stimuli. So two sets of vocal stimuli, one taken from newscasts and one from broadcast interviews with athletes. I have conducted uh, a pilot study with an open-ended questionnaire first in order to elicit evaluative adjectives for my accent evaluation study. And um, I'm currently, data collection is still ongoing but hopefully coming to some close soon um, for my rating scale study in Germany and the UK. It's been incredibly difficult to find enough people and to convince people to take part, so um, maybe I'll talk about that later mm -hmm. a bit. Um, and then I'm combining that with a qualitative ap approach in which I conduct conversational interviews that vary a bit in length because people have had, um, well, simply some people had, ha have had more to say than others and I didn't want to cut anyone short so some interviews were 45 minutes I wasn't planning for that in advance but um, they were very interesting so I would love to include them all and I think I've currently conducted um, almost 50 interviews so. Um, so I've conducted them with Kenyans and Nigerians who were born in Kenya or Nigeria respectively and who are currently living in Germany or the UK. I would like to start with a couple of examples from the interviews here to give you a first impression into what 
people have actually told me. And um, I've told you earlier that Blomard says that there's a clash of norms, particularly in transnational contexts where people move from one place to another. And so I was interested, of course, in first of all, whether this clash of norms plays a role for people, whether this actually is a problem or not. So um, from the comments that I have here, um, they are from interviews that I conducted here in the UK. Um, and I'm just going to read them out now. So one person said there was already sort of a big African diaspora like from all over, Nigerian, Ghanaian, Congolese. So there wasn't this sense, you know, from others that I was somehow different because everyone was different somehow. That was a young woman I asked, you know, what was it like when you came to Great Britain? What did it feel like for you um, with respect to language? Then there was another comment pretty similar to that that I chose for um, for this, um, that's um, someone said, I think most people here in the UK or London especially, they are not really bothered about accents because they know that London is a multicultural city. That's how they want to label it. So from these two examples, we could get the idea that there actually is a happy democracy of voices in London. And I think that's also important to mention that not everyone I talked to has said that this has been a problem. Some have simply said, yeah, there are lots of different people with lots of different accents. I don't have a problem with that. They don't have a problem with that. So they were fine. On the other hand, <clears throat> I've actually had a lot of comments of the following kind that have shown that people do have problems in everyday life related to accents, related to different varieties of English. So that this clash of norms actually um, matters to their everyday life in some way. Um, there have been comments that have shown that it's problematic regarding work. So if you look at this comment here, someone said, I think the most difficulty I found is when I started working in the office. Because I feared when the phone would ring, because the other person on the line would, sometimes, uh, would not sometimes understand you. But the way you're pronouncing, then it makes you think, excuse me, is it that I don't know the English? So this person really said she was mortified to pick up the phone because people kept saying, I can't understand you. And she thought that her English was pretty clear and, and everyone should be able to understand her. I didn't have a problem understanding her anyway, but um, apparently that really made her work life very hard. Then I had another uh, person who said my flatmate's granddad, he would joke, you know, every time I picked up the phone. But he'd say, you know, it sounds like I've called one of those takeaway joints. I didn't think she sounded like a takeaway joint at all. You know, she had this really almost, to me, very British sounding Queen's English-like variety of English. And um, I think the, these comments really hurt her. So it's, it's really a very personal thing as well that this flatmate's granddad kept saying these sorts of things. And then a more general comment um, at the end here. Um, when you're speaking, people might think you don't know English, maybe because you're not pronouncing the way they are pronouncing. So I don't know then who is right in pronunciation and who is wrong. So um, yeah, that already tells us something about the orientation maybe as well. So people actually think about um, what might be the right pronunciation in this context because obviously if you're confronted with these kinds of things all the time you start thinking hey what is actually this correct English and who's right here and who's not because before that their English seemed to be fine before they moved to Great Britain in this case but then suddenly it's not and um, not everyone thinks that that should be so simple. I also then asked people directly in the interviews, you know, um, what do you think about certain varieties of English in order to find out what their opinion um, about these different varieties is and also maybe um, which hierarchy from their attitudinal perspective exists between the different varieties of English. So when I asked them about British English, I think that there was a very strong tendency for many people to um, 
say that that seemed to be somewhat of a target English for them. And um, they said that they found it to be the correct variety of English, the original, and they saw it as very prestigious. Um, and I'm talking about standard British English here because they did not like other varieties of British English all that much when I asked them in the interviews. And some of them also said they were quite surprised and quite taken aback when they came to Great Britain and um, actually um, felt that lots of people couldn't speak British English at all even though they were British. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so these are just two examples. I like the British action, accent. Well, I would say the post-British accent would be a typical example. Someone else, in that case, a young Kenyan English, uh, young Kenyan lady, said um, when I asked her about her favorite accent, "It's Queen's English just because it was what I was taught, and even what my parents were taught to be the correct English." It was what was spoken in the time we were colonized, and so that's what I see to be correct, as opposed to nowadays, when there's a lot more slang involved. So that is quite a strong motivation there as well, and I wouldn't have expected such um, a comment from such a young lady, actually, but that's what she said, and so I'm including it here. Anyway, but the point is that British English seemed to be very much a target for lots of people I talked to. American English, on the other hand, in the interviews, not very popular, often perceived to be incorrect, and people had very strong opinions about American English, actually, so two examples that are quite typical for my interviews here. American English is very strange and loud, aggressive, and strong. I really, really hate the American accent. It is slow-pitched and very nasal, so it's sort of whiny to me. And I'm not distinguishing distinguishing between my British and uh, sorry between my Kenyan and Nigerian respondents here because I think the tendencies are pretty similar actually from the interviews that I conducted. Um, I also asked people about their own home country English, which seemed to um, carry covert prestige for them, seemed to be an identity marker as well, of course, and. Um, for some also um, it was important with respect to pan-Africanism, so not just to show that they were from Kenya or Nigeria, but also um, to show that they were African. So a very typical comment here sounds like home. Um, an another comment that I found very interesting was there's that unique accent and I think that's a diversity that makes us appreciate ourselves as being Kenyan, being African. Um, one further tendency that I would like to point out that also came out in some interviews at least um, was that people said, actually, um, I like a lot of accents. I wouldn't really make such a difference. I wouldn't choose one over the other. Um, so someone said, what I like is people speaking clearly. I don't mind whether there's an accent overlaid on top of that. So it didn't matter at all to this person whether someone had an accent that sounded Kenyan, Nigerian, African, Chinese, French, or something completely different altogether. Um, and I think that's an important tendency as well. Um, not everyone said something like that, but um, that actually is something that a couple of people also pointed out. Okay, I would now like to switch to the other perspective, to, to my quantitative um, accent evaluation study. Um, and I would like to introduce quickly what I used as vocal stimuli for the accent evaluation study. I used authentic recordings. Um, that's an approach that has been employed successfully by a couple of researchers, but obviously has some shortcomings as well. If you use very controlled um, vocal stimuli, that has its advantages, but I thought it might be of advantage for my study to use authentic recordings as well. And if you use very controlled um, vocal stimuli, for example, um, I've read somewhere that people said they chose a neutral text for people to read out. And I really wonder how a text could ever be neutral, but um, we could discuss that later on. Um, anyway, so I thought it would be good to actually use authentic material for that. Um, I already pointed out that I used a more formal context on the one hand from newscasts and a more informal context on the other hand 
So athletes in broadcast interviews, I tried to control the content to some extent, of course. So I tried to pick similar international news items for the newscasts and similar interview passages for the athletes. For the athletes, I also chose situations where they all um, were asked directly after their competition, so it wasn't unfair to one of them because they were just giving a, an interview in some completely different context. And um, so it was pretty much the same situation for all of them. They're about 30 seconds long. Um, I only have female speakers, which is due to time constraints. I would have loved to have a male set for all of them again, but then um, I have people from seven different countries, the UK, the US, Kenya, Nigeria, Jamaica, Germany, and China. And that for both the sets, and then in additional male and female speakers, and no one would do the survey. So <laughs> I think it's simply a time constraint. Um, for the newscasts, I tried to pick speakers who used standard English plus what's been described as representative for the individual varieties in the relevant literature. And for the interviews, similarly, um, I tried to use speakers who did show features that are supposed to be representative of the varieties. But here, they all also use some non-standard features. I then had uh, this type of questionnaire, so uh, a four-point Likert scale. People could choose between disagree, tend to disagree, tend to agree, and agree. And they were also they were always asked to say um, something about the following question. To me, this newscaster sounded or statement, um, and then one item: so professional, friendly, confident, arrogant, correct, clear refined, pleasant, and authentic. And for the athletes, pleasant was replaced by cool. Um, I had two additional items that kind of uh, lie outside this core a little bit. So I also asked, um, mm, uh, to me, this speaker sounded like a native speaker of English and like she tried to address a worldwide audience. Then well, there were always for each speaker two open-ended questions. So where do you think this newscaster comes from? And any further impressions that people had of a newscaster? Because sometimes really interesting thoughts come up there as well. So who are my respondents for this study? I have 64 respondents from Kenyan and Nigerian communities in Germany and the UK. 61 of them are included in the analysis, three of them I didn't like, no, just kidding. Um, they simply didn't give enough answers, so I couldn't include them in the um, analysis. They would all be considered to be educated, so they all have um, a high school uh, degree, and um, most of them have a uni some university education or are currently pursuing a university degree. They are adults of different age groups, they were all born in Kenya or Nigeria, respectively. Um, their length of stay in the country of residence varies from below one year to more than 10 years. So a couple of months was the minimum. There are 27 respondents from Kenya and 34 from Nigeria. And you can see that there's a slight problem still with my data. If you look at um, the distribution here, in the different groups, so I still need especially some male Kenyans, <laughs> some female Nigerians. If you know any, please put them in touch with me so that they can fill out the survey. Okay, regarding my results so far, so this is obviously work in progress, it's not set in stone, and if a couple of, couple of people still answer this, um, might change a bit. Um, I left actually left the two groups together here. I did um, have a look at them separately as well, but they were actually quite similar. And so I thought before I have all the um, answers, I will leave them together. So this will be an overview for both groups for today. And um, I conducted um, an ANOVA for the evaluation of the newscasters. And I would lo now like to show you the descriptive statistics with the overall means that each newscaster received 
for the nine core traits that I illustrated earlier. So uh, the newscaster sounded professional, um, friendly, and so on. On a scale from one disagree to four agree. So four is good, one is not. Um, if we look at the results here, we can see that the British speaker is the front runner. <laughs> um, but if we look at the lowest speaker there, the overall mean is 2.95. So on a scale from one to four, that's actually still pretty high. And we can say that all newscasters actually receive fairly positive ratings in this group. Um, the British speaker actually also is rated significantly higher than all other speakers except the German one, who by the way sounds quite British as well, so I need to mention that. <coughs> um, the home country newscaster, so for the Nigerians, that's the Nigerian, for the Kenyans, the Kenyan newscaster, um, is still fairly high there and on one level with the American speaker actually. So they come in pretty much exactly the same position at the moment. And then the other African speaker, Chinese and Jamaican speakers are preferred. And I would like to show you a direct comparison to my German reference group there so that you can see that the respondents from Kenya and Nigeria actually differ. Um, we still get fairly positive evaluations for all the speakers in this group, but there's a wider range. And I think that could be an indication that there's actually a higher tolerance towards different accents in the African group of respondents than among Germans who um, seem to have pretty strong opinions and stronger opinions from um, what I can say about um, how English should be spoken and what is correct and what not. So um, the German speaker was not identified as a German speaker by the German respondents at all. Um, they all thought she was British. So basically the German and the British speaker come in first, both representing um, a British or British influenced variety of English and then there's a fairly huge gap before all others. And um, then the African and Jamaican speakers actually receive the lowest ratings in this group so that also obviously differs very much from the African answers because the home country variety received a fairly high rating there. I was also interested in this question then and in how it compares to the overall means for the newscasters. So um, when people were asked to state whether to them the newscaster sounded like a native speaker, um, I was interested in whether this corresponds to a high rating in the overall mean when they think that someone does sound like a native speaker. So what we can actually see here is <laughs> very clearly that the overall ratings lie very close together. So that didn't come out as clearly in, in the other um, table that I just showed you. So the blue bars here are the answers for um, how much did they think this person sounded like a native speaker. And um, the red ones represent the overall mean. So we can see that the British and American speakers were considered to be the prototypical um, native speakers, surprisingly. <laughs> and um, that very low native speaker ratings correspond to a lower overall evaluation, although the overall evaluation is not as much lower as the native speaker rating, of course. Um, speakers from the home country and Germany have kind of medium sp uh, ratings as how much did they sound as a native speaker, but they have pretty high overall ratings. So um, that does actually not correspond very much to each other in the um, group of African respondents that I asked. We have had a look at the overall means, but I did look at very different 
items actually. So you can see a wonderful chart here with the different items. Don't worry, you don't have to follow every line here. This just shows that there are huge differences actually depending on which exact trade or which exact item you look at. You can see that the British speaker is pretty much consistently very high. That's the light blue line up here for all trades except for <laughs> not arrogant. <laughs> So their um, other speakers are much preferred, or at least to some extent. Um, and what we can also see is that the American speaker is considered to be the least friendly by far and the most arrogant here. Okay. Um, anything else I want to mention here? Yeah, um, if we look at um, the home country English, that would be the green line here. So you can see that, for example, for clarity, that's fairly high up. For how confident did the speaker sound, it's also fairly high. And it's also not considered to sound very arrogant. I did conduct a principal component analysis to have a look at how the individual items bundle together then. And I don't know if that's clear enough, but I'll explain. So um, I still have to work on the statistics a little bit here. And actually for the newscasts, the principal component analysis does not work perfectly because most of the items bundle on one factor that could be called confidence, uh, sorry, competence for um, newscasters. So professional, friendly, confident, correct, clear, refined, pleasant and authentic. And on the other hand, solidarity, so not or arrogant and friendly bundle together to some extent. However, it's problematic that friendly, for whatever reason, seems to bundle or seems to load onto both factors. But if we look at the different results here, we can see that for competence, um, especially the British speaker that's up here, very high. Um, so is the German speaker, by the way. <laughs> um, and the, uh, if we look at the solidarity ratings, American and British English are actually downgraded to some degree. So we can see that for American English, this is much lower than for all the others. So that obviously corresponds to what I just showed you earlier, considered to be the least friendly and the most arrogant speaker. Um, and British English's solidarity is lower than competence, but still up fairly high. And we can see that for those varieties where competence was somewhat low for Jamaican English, for the other African variety of English and Chinese English, these solidarity ratings actually um, go up a lot. And it's also interesting to see that for the home country variety, that's this here, both are fairly high. So for the newscasts, we can see that all varieties are actually evaluated fairly positively by my Kenyan and Nigerian respondents and that a range of accents seems to be accepted here and more so than among the German respondents. And there seems to be some acceptance of the home country variety even though it's not the um, first in terms of overall means that comes in here. Um, among the respondents in terms of both competence and solidarity. The Chinese, other African and Jamaican newscasters, so um, speakers from the outer and expanding circle are rated lower in terms of competence but upgraded in terms of solidarity. British English overall is preferred, it's also rated significantly higher than most other varieties and certainly not replaced by American English in this context, so from an attitudinal perspective, um, not from the interviews and not for the newscasts, we can see that there's um, any sort of replacement of British English. 
um, by American English for this particular group of respondents. Okay, and both British and American English are rated higher for competence than solidarity. For the athletes, we can see that they receive fairly high ratings overall as well, but lower than the newscasters. They ha there's a very small range actually for the athletes, even smaller than for the newscasters. So the lowest overall mean is 2.7, the highest is 2.94. That's really close and there are no statistically significant differences whatsoever. Um, that, however, also fits with one additional question I asked in the, surveys, uh, in the survey, which accents do you prefer for athletes in newscasts? That's a question that I simply asked in addition. And lots of people actually wrote something like, whichever accent they speak in as long as they are clear. Or athletes are athletes, they don't need to have specific accents. If um, we also look at the different traits here, we can see that maybe the overall mean evaluation doesn't really make that much sense for the athletes because the individual items differ a lot. So, um, for example, um, in terms of the items, how professional did you find the speaker or how clear did you find the speaker? The British and American speakers come in before all others, so that's these two, um, the light blue and the dark blue line here, and for clear, that's here. Even though I chose people who also, as I said, use non-standard features in their, in their um, accent. And, um, but we can see that for, for example, for friendly or not arrogant, or arrogant again, the picture changes completely and the African speakers, the Chinese or the German speaker here rate fairly high. So here for example, for not arrogant, that's most clear I think. Again I try to see how do these things bundle together, it works better for the athletes than for the newscasters. So um, competence for this factor, um, the items professional, confident, correct, clear, refined and cool bundled together and for solidarity, friendly, not arrogant and authentic. So what can we see from this? First of all, athletes are generally not considered to be professional because all the professional ratings are below the solidarity ratings or all the competence ratings there. Um, but apart from that, British and American speakers are rated higher and also significantly higher than, for example, the German and Chinese speakers in terms of competence. And in terms of solidarity, American and British English and the Jamaican speaker are rated lower than all others. So for the athletes, we can say that the overall means are very similar. Um, the UK and US speakers receive the highest ratings followed by the two athletes from Africa um, and the UK and US speakers are higher than the other athletes in terms of competence but lower in terms of solidarity whereas the home country and other African athletes are fairly high in terms of both competence and solidarity. So overall in my um, accent evaluation study, we can see that for both categories, several varieties were evaluated positively by the Kenyan and Nigerian respondents and that a range of accents seems to be accepted. There seems to be an acceptance of the home country variety and the other African variety in terms of competence and solidarity. But particularly in newscasts, British English is preferred and also rated above all others. Um, both British English and American English are rated lower in terms of solidarity than competence. American English is not replacing or equaling British, British English in newscasts, but they are on the same level regarding the athletes' interviews. The speakers from the expanding circle, so in my case China and Germany, are, they pretty much always receive high ratings in solidarity. And um, I think it depends very much on the exact context, on the news or the interview, depending on what you actually listen to, which speaker comes in where, and also on the dimension, obviously, as I've 
showed. So I said earlier that I find it very difficult that normative orientation is often described in terms of exo and endonormativity. And maybe that makes sense if you look at attitudes in one particular country. It does not make so much sense if you actually look at people who move from one country to another because what is this exo? What is outside? What is inside for these people? I mean, if you live in one country and never move out, maybe it's clear that whatever is spoken in this country is inside and whatever is spoken <coughs> in somewhere else is outside. But um, that's not sufficient for the kind of situation that I'm looking at. So it's really difficult to describe uh, the situation in, in these terms. And so I think that there should be some wider notion of a norm as well, because I, as I've seen, and I've also tried to illustrate with the results earlier, um, what if actually a range of accents is accepted? Then we cannot really say that there's an orientation towards one variety. So maybe um, we need a different kind of notion for this norm as well. And we probably don't need it for every context, but at least I think we should think about um, introducing other terms there. And I just um, thought about a couple of terms that would be necessary. There are others that uh, we should maybe intru introduce as well. But there needs to be a term for what if people actually show loyalty towards a home country variety. And I've called this origin normativity here. What if several varieties are accepted as the norm? maybe plurinormativity, and what something that I think might also be quite likely is that people accept a small set of varieties only, and um, so we might call this oligonormativity. Okay, so what's going to happen in the future with my study? So uh, as I said, I'm still hoping to get a few more respondents so that the different groups kind of are more even and I can actually compare them better and now kind of put them together but I need to actually look at the differences in more detail as well and um, so I'm hoping for some more people and please as I said send them my way if you know anyone else. Um, I'm also currently trying to get a few more people from um, other backgrounds as reference groups and I have a couple of answers, but I'm trying to collect some more so that I can not only have a look at how do they compare to German respondents, but also to British and African respondents from Nigeria and Kenya. And obviously for the interviews, I only gave you um, a couple of examples now, but in general I'm also still um, in the process of uh, analyzing them and hoping to get a more in-depth analysis soon about these experiences. Oh, sorry, this is double. So um, I would like to end on um, the quote here. The rest, I've already said that, so sorry about that. Um, and I hope that maybe there might be a happy democracy of voices if more people think like that. One of my respondents said, listening to me and trying to put yourself in my shoe, we can all understand one another. So um, I think that's a nice um, way to end this. And um, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. There were different varieties, so I uh, okay. can't really compare them directly.
I tend to think that they would be very different, actually. Um, I also think that maybe people... Good luck. Bye. Um, I tend to think that maybe also people who um, really like American English might have moved to America if they had the choice and, and not uh, to Great Britain. I mean, the reasons for moving to a country can be various, obviously, but... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I, th I think that um, maybe if people have um, financial opportunities to choose where to go and they really like the American culture and the American kind of uh, way of speaking English, they might not have moved to Great Britain in the first place. So that would be one possible reason. And I also think simply what people are used to might also play a huge role. And um, um, yeah, maybe... I've only asked very conservative people, I don't know, but certainly from that set of respondents, um, British English was m more popular, especially for the newscast, but also in the interviews when I simply asked people. But I think that might be different if you ask people in the US. Sure. And one other little thing about the US, which, um, I think, uh, I mean, they were holding evidence that um, gender affects the most information, uh, so everything should be constantly male. Of course, it might be entirely different. Um, however, this aspect is kind of cancelled out if you only use people from one gender because then you simply only look at the varieties. I already said it. I think it would be very, very interesting, but I think that we'll have to wait for my next study because um, really um, I couldn't have included more samples and I just had to cut it and I wanted to really leave in the informal and formal distinction between the contexts as well. And so it would have been so many speakers then that I think I would have even fewer respondents. <laughs> yeah, so maybe next, next paper or study. <laughs> I don't know if anyone really has done extensive research on this development. I always ask my respondents in the interviews, have your attitudes changed since you've left um, your home country? And if yes, how? And I think the answer that I got most often was actually that people said it's made me appreciate accents of English more because before I left actually I didn't think about accents a lot there was just English basically they just saw it as one kind of one thing and not different accents and then they came here and they actually noticed okay there, there might be very very different accents and um, the other thing is that well I think I touched on that earlier as well that some people told me okay when I moved, I realized that I always thought British English was this really ideal kind of form of language. And then I came to Great Britain and I talked to people on the streets or anywhere and it doesn't sound like that at all. And um, they suddenly thought that their own English was much better than what, what's actually spoken here. And also with respect to people from other countries, for example, other European countries where English is not a first language, people felt that, um, well, they were simply much more proficient in English because obviously they had used it all their lives and uh, the other people had not. And so these were some aspects that I could detect there. But yeah, that's obviously not extensive research. And But I think, yes, there are changes in the attitudes. Um, you mentioned one thing, you mentioned about getting used to the accent in a particular place, if they move to a particular place. Um, and I think that's something which is a bit more of an observation than, than a question. 
um, people who've done research into English and the lingua franca, mm -hmm. they, they say that you have to get sort of, a, I don't know to say this politely, kind of fresh meat, <laughs> if you like, because um, they, they said that the, the minute that somebody moves to a country where English is, is, is the norm, is, 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 is the, uh, the language of that country, then their accent changes and their attitudes change. So you have, you have to kind of do research with people who haven't moved somewhere else. Okay. Yeah, and you said your people have lived in England or Germany for what we think one in ten years. So that's uh, quite, quite, quite different. Yeah, they, they, the length of the stay, stay differs from a few months to more than ten years. So. Any, any correlations between that and the analysis? Um, I tried to have a look at that um, and I'm still kind of hoping to get a few more people so that the groups in that respect also even out a little bit because statistically you can't really say anything. Um, what I can say, there are differences, yes, um, and I feel that from the people I asked, people who have been here for longer actually tell me that it was more problematic for them when they moved here, when they first moved here, than those people who have only been here for a very short time now. So that was one tendency that kind of was interesting and I thought, okay, maybe things have changed in London uh, and these comments that I showed you earlier about this happy place with multicultural English <laughs> um, that were all younger people who hadn't been here for very long. Um, yeah, so Maybe. <laughs> so yes, I think that's a factor. And and where did they come from? Um, complete okay. Um, yeah, because I think there's a difference if someone really starts learning English um, and comes from a country like Germany, <laughs> or um, whether um, you are from a country like um, Kenya, for example, where you actually do encounter British English in a lot of um, news casts and so on. So I, I think. Um, most people I talked to didn't find it as difficult to follow as maybe someone from Germany would find it and they are already a little bit used to it when they come here but yeah so maybe that also goes back to your question and maybe the people are loyal to their um, uh, country of uh, residence as well and and maybe that's where a difference between American uh, well people living in the US and people living here could come in Um, they were not, there wasn't anyone from Liverpool in my sound samples for the accent evaluation study, but I always talked about this uh, in the interviews as well. And most people um, pretty much said that they found uh, other accents from the UK uh, pretty strange and hard to follow. And um, so, yeah, I mean, they were most of the time. People then stated accents from the north of England or also Scottish English um, that they found very, very strange and just, uh, yeah, or funny, but certainly not to be taken seriously. When my experience came in when I visited Manchester you know, and I realized that. Um, the north is another country, yeah. Yeah, very really different. Um, yeah. The London accent was um, yeah, and my experience also showed that um, I didn't differentiate between the accent until today. You know, 
Yeah. Yeah. That's different. <laughs> yeah. So, was your. Uh, I can. I haven't been able. But this is online, by the way. If you want to do the test, I, so I think I've circulated the link. I couldn't actually listen, listen to it myself because I didn't have the updated flash player. <laughs> I couldn't update it. But, um, so is your British accent like RP type or kind of BBC English or is it a London kind of. Like kind of um, in the newscasts, I would say it's a BBC type English, um, and uh, in for the athletes, uh, not so much. <laughs> that that's more, um, yeah, East London, <laughs> with a little bit of glottal stops and uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I thought, you know, I mean, if I'm looking at a context that's more informal, then it makes more sense to actually take an example where someone also uses a couple of features that don't sound like RP. And um, if you compare um, foreign accents and uh, your home country English uh, and another African accent and a non-standard British accent, that's completely different than if you compare a foreign accent and BBC English, obviously. So... That's why for the athletes I try to kind of choose a different form of British English. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just thought it'd be interesting to know, um, if it, I don't know how you might ever get an experiment to this, but because you were looking at people, you know, snippets of people saying something, um, and how much personality, personality within the voice, because, I mean, the way I speak and then the way another British person with a maybe just a bit more animated or someone who's a bit more monotonous, um, you know, you, how, how much your accent affects what people think of you and how much it's just your personality, like right? how can you differentiate that? Yeah, that's obviously a very problematic point, yeah. Um, I mean, in the original matched guys type studies, people tried to trick their respondents by using the same speaker for different languages and just telling them that they were different speakers and kind of mixing one or two speakers up. And that then cancels out this problem. However, for the accents that I'm using, you couldn't really do that because I don't think that anyone could really claim to do these accents authentically, <laughs> or at least I wouldn't be sure if they <laughs> could do it authentically. So yeah, there is, um, to some extent, that problem will always remain and you cannot really take it out completely. Obviously, I tried not to use speakers that sound completely different, but yeah. I mean, that's one, one problem with the authentic um, material. Yeah, for, for the contents, as I said, I tried to use fairly similar international news items, so they were always um, news a news item on um, the Middle East or North Africa, um, which also results in some people simply always, when asked to guess where the speaker comes from, guessing the country that's mentioned in the newscast. <laughs> but um, yeah, so um, I mean, from the newscasts, I think from the content, you can't really guess um, where the speakers are from because they are all um, about another country, so no one is reporting about their own country at all, and I think that would be hard to, to guess from the content, really. For the athletes, I actually tried to get <laughs> um, athletes from just one uh, kind of sport first, but it's really difficult to actually get um, similar sounding athletes with the linguistic features that you want and from all seven countries and uh, all female and all with uh, this very same uh, sport. So um, I kind of um, had to um, 
give up on that and I, I still try to you know kind of control it by um, using the same situation and I try to use um, as many people um, doing athletics or running as possible because that seems to be more universal than other sports but um, unfortunately I had to include one tennis player and that uh, results in people saying that's Serena Williams even though she's from China <laughs> and certainly does not sound like Serena Williams but um, <laughs> but yeah Talking of tennis players, I was, I, I just, I'm just wondering um, there's, some, there's some people have coaches you know um, if you listen to for example interviews with Andy Murray a uh, famous tennis player um, his accent has definitely changed over the, over the years since he started. He used to have a, a, a broad Scottish accent, but he's obviously had a voice coach yeah. to move kind of towards the middle of the Atlantic um, for a wider audience, mm -hmm. let's say. And I don't know how many of your other athletes might have had that. Because I'm just wondering, you say you, you, you say these are formal versus informal types mm. of interviews, but all of these athletes are aware that they're talking to a wider yeah. audience. Yeah. So you can't really say it's as informal as a conversation, an informal conversation between people. Obviously, that's still a public context and that obviously still influences um, the ratings as well. Um, so maybe in for a conversation, the people would choose a completely different hierarchy of Englishes than for this context. Um, however, yeah, I think that um, uh, still most of the athletes for, for most, I can be pretty certain that they have not had any coaching regarding language and um, maybe, um, especially for the Chinese athlete, maybe she has, but um, she's still struggling with English, you can hear that. And, and so, um, yeah, I think others, I try to also use athletes that are not very famous so that that is not so much of an issue because I think the more famous someone is the more successful they are um, the, the, the more money they have and the more likely they will be to pay for a voice coach <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the others uh, probably probably not so much yeah. but, but do you think we can safely assume that these casters have been called? yeah <laughs> I think all of them yeah I mean, you can obviously discuss whether um, the coaching has been similar for all of them. I don't know about that, and I would say maybe not, but I think they all have received coaching, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I had one set of results now because that's one of the problems that I still have is, as I said with a couple of other things, that the groups are not, not even and you can't really then uh, work very well with the statistics. But I think, yes, there is a difference um, uh, or a couple of differences, but um, I can't really um, yeah, give you a very detailed account of them yet. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> No. Okay. They had to guess. Yeah. And when they guess, did you see anything significant about the class? If they thought these people were a new class? I think for. Oh no, I, I didn't ask them to guess uh, which, uh, you know, uh, economic status or which class they thought for the speaker. I, they just had to guess which country they were from. Mm -hmm. So, no, they did not mention anything That's about a class. Related, Hmm. I always had this um, question, are there any further impressions about the newscaster and I'm thankful that some people actually took the time to fill in these uh, things as well because that gives you some additional insight into some of the answers. Um, for the newscasters I think it doesn't play much of a role because they all, as you pointed out, have had uh, some sort of voice training or, and um, I think that they all speak standard English in such a way that you couldn't really tell easily what their their background with respect to classes or anything like that. For the 
Um, athletes, yes, I did get some comments, but that was more or less consistent. So it wasn't just one athlete that got these comments. Um, you know, maybe has a background. Um, I did get one comment uh, where someone said we actually re referred explicitly to class um, other than that class was not actually mentioned but yeah there were some comments uh, referring to the speaker's backgrounds then saying you know especially for the British speaker for example this is a person who grew up in East London and so being very specific about that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Good observation. Yeah, I did. Um, um, there are obviously also you can argue for or against that. Um, what I'm doing is forcing people to choose between good and bad basically. So uh, because if you leave the middle choice in then um, it can happen that people will just you know always say yeah it's in between in between in between and then I thought maybe that kind of makes it difficult to I interpret the results and I just thought you know maybe it's better to by this force people to at least say I tend to agree or tend to disagree which might sometimes be difficult but then I think um, I talked to people about whether they had any problems with the questionnaire and they didn't find it too problematic to choose so I th maybe it was a good approach for that then. Sometimes maybe you find a pattern in those who chose just the middle one, middle choice. Maybe you find a pattern, okay. Mm. No. I, I yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. If you had enough response, you could compare, but you don't have enough, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> to make a decision at the beginning. Mm. Yeah. As you said, there are pros and cons. Well, my survey is anonymous, so I don't really know who answered um, what in the survey, so I can't relate it to the interviews directly, what they said in the survey. So that's difficult. I can only go from the interview um, information, and I don't think I can really point out a tendency there. No. Mm. And then they think about the other aspects. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you. Thank you.